Hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Cooking with Shada. This is where I teach you how to make healthy, delicious plant-based meals that are salt, oil, and sugar-free. I'm excited today as we have a special guest, John Pierre. He is the author of the two books, two Pil The Pillars of Health and Strong, Savvy, and Safe. For those of you that don't may know or may not know, I met John Pierre at a lecture that he was giving uh, with Chef AJ, and I just really resonated with John Pierre with everything that he was saying regarding nutrition, regarding fitness, just everything. And that was when I had just was I was about to start my journey on this weight loss plan, and I decided to start working with JP and to work with AJ, and that was one of the best things I ever did. JP has been very instrumental, as has AJ, in my weight loss. And I couldn't have done it without him for everything that he has helped me with, whether it was working on my mind, working on weights, working, you know, to love myself more, just everything. He has always been there and has always helped me. He does private coaching for those of you that may want someone uh, to help you with that, to give you some private coaching. He is available. And I'm going to let him talk a little bit more about that. But I'm telling you, he was a huge instrument in my 120 pound weight loss that I've already kept off for, it's going to be almost 11 years, which I'm just thrilled about. But I don't want to take up all the space. And we do have a lot of questions. I want to thank everybody who has submitted their questions today. We are going to continue our talk with the pillars of health, um, the pillar of nutrition. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, John Pierre to our show. Thank you. I didn't realize it was 11 years. You've kept all that weight off and had all this vibrancy and fitness. That's amazing. Yes. 11, it's going to be 11 years, January 12th. And I'm totally excited. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a miracle what you've done. You know, you put all the hard work in and, you know, you have some coaching, which is important, but you know, you're doing all the work. So congratulations. Well, thank you so much. Um, if you're okay, J JP, I'd like to start on the questions. We have a lot of questions that you guys have submitted. We are going to try and get through all the weight loss and nutrition questions that you guys have all asked. Now, just bear in mind that this is going to be continued. Uh, we're going to have JP on as long as that he wants, and we, you know, we love to have him on the show. So if we are question does not get answered today, I promise you we are going to come back and we will answer your questions. So you good with that, JP? Yeah, that's perfect. Let the questions roll and I'll do my best to answer what I can. Okay, sounds good. So JP, how important is the environment when you are trying to lose weight? Mm. Well, as you know, <laughs> when I worked with you, that was one of the most <laughs> important things. And I always use the term, you have to sanitize your environment. And generally, when I speak about environment, I'm talking about everywhere you go. But for the most part, it's your home environment that you have to be really cautious of. Outside too, but at home, it's critical because if your family have all, has all sorts of snacks and goodies in the house, you're going to find your way to those goodies. There's no escaping that. So unless you're sterilizing your environment and keeping it very clean and keeping those foods away from you, you're gonna to go to them eventually. It's just a matter of time. You won't be successful then. And so people often say, well, how can I do it when my kids eat junk food and their husband or wife eats junk food? Well, you try to, you know, you do your best to work the program the best you can. And one thing we often recommend is look at, if you can afford it, get an extra refrigerator and put it in another room or a garage and let that be the family's junk food or that could be your refrigerator. I don't know, whatever works for you get some cabinets that just are strictly for your family or strictly for you. And then you're only going into your cabinets. And oftentimes I'll have my clients, uh, if none of those work, then I'll say, oh, fine. Just make sure your family puts all their goodies and brown paper bags in the refrigerator so you don't see them. You have to stack the deck in your favor because you're, most people are food addicts and they're going to be drawn into these foods. And it's very difficult to be successful if you're constantly tempting yourself, it's like when I work with clients who are drug addicts or especially alcoholics, and they're in rehab for three, maybe three months, six months, I've had clients in over you know, a year, once they get out, I don't call them up and say, hey, I'll pick you up. And then we're going to go throw some darts at the local tavern. It's like, what? No, don't worry. We're, we're just going to throw darts. You don't have to drink. It's too tempting. And it's the same thing with these foods. So you, sanitizing your environment is absolutely critical. It's going to make you or break you. 
put a lot of work into keeping that environment clean. Now, when you go out of town, oh man, that's even, even more dangerous when you're traveling. And if you remember Shada, I had you taking photos of your food, sending me your food diary, making plans, keeping on the straight and narrow, only going to restaurants that we, we decided ahead of time that wouldn't be tempting, staying out of grocery stores, unless they're just produce. So you, when, you, when you travel, it's tough. When you're at home, it's tough, but it's what's gonna make you or break you. So you have to have a clean environment. But what do you say to people? Cause I've had this question come up to me cause I agree with you. I think environment is huge. And I was lucky enough that when I first started I was living by myself. So I could really control my environment. And when I did move back home my mom was 100% supportive of what I was doing. And so that was really help. But I have people ask me, like, what do you do when the husband and the children are refusing it and they have to cook two separate meals? They have to cook their meals that's completely compliant to what they need to do in order to be successful. But then they also have to cook another meal because the kids want something totally different. And they might be young kids. And I, and I get it that, you know, mom has to make food for the kids and for the husband as well. To me, that makes it really difficult. I think I, like me, I, I really do not wanna, I didn't wanna come back to the house and have to make a, you know, dinner from or lunch for myself. And then I'd have to make something totally different that I wouldn't even eat and make it for someone else, what, even, even if it was for my mom. I, that, to me, that's just really hard. So I don't know how to like, go around that. And the best thing I would think is, you know, hopefully you can sit and talk to your partner and talk to your kids so that they can understand where you're coming from and to try to really help you. So how do you navigate through that? How do you navigate through you possibly having to make two separate meals? Well, you know, when, when I did a, a program in Las Vegas with Chef AJ, I did a men's support group because most of the women in the pro most of the people in the program are women and their husbands came and it was basically just me and a group of all these men and they were baffled on why this is so difficult why can't i keep my my chocolate brownies in the refrigerator or my cases of uh beer or whatever it is and once i explained to them that when you put your chocolate brownie in the refrigerator as soon as your wife or it could be your husband but in this case it was their wife sees it that image and that whole concept of the chocolate brownie is banging on their brain all day long. When they I go agree. to work, they're thinking of the chocolate brownie. When they come home and they're cleaning or cooking or interacting with their family, they're thinking of the chocolate brownie. It's And basically what I said in a loving way is how dare you, how dare you tempt, tempt your loved one like that? It would be no different than if your wife <laughs> or your husband just came out of rehab and you just pop you know, beer after beer and said, hey, this smells good, doesn't it? It's like nobody in their right mind would do that. And the reason is, is because people do not take food addiction seriously. They take alcoholism and drug abuse seriously, but they don't take food addiction seriously. So one, you want to educate your family. There's lots of good books and different uh, podcasts and things you can listen to on food addiction. And the other thing is, look, and I'm just giving you the solution. I'm not saying the solution is easy, but I am saying I've been doing working with clients for over 35 years. And if your environment isn't clean, it's very difficult to be successful. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but you're not stacking the deck in your favor. And when you're stressed or things aren't going well for you, you'll succumb to what's in the refrigerator pretty much guaranteed. So I don't think Shada, there's an easy solution, but I just want you to keep in mind, somebody asked the question, so I'm just giving you the answer. It's critical for your success, but it's not necessarily always gonna be easy. No, and I and I agree with you. Um, and I've and I've learned over time that really things that that are that are you know the most difficult, you get the best outcome because you are putting the work into it, and you will be successful if you really do apply yourself and do what needs to be done. And and I totally agree with that. Um, okay, well, how do you feel about temptations? Because to me, temptations are just going to drive you crazy, and they're going to keep knocking on your head, and you're just going to like eventually give in and then people say well i've got really good willpower not to give into that temptation no. and then my i don't think willpower works that's just me it never worked for me it may work for like that five first five minutes 30 minutes 40 minutes but eventually i ended up going back and having whatever it was that was tempting me because willpower is not going to work so how do you deal with that 
Well, if willpower worked, you and Joe and Fred and Mary wouldn't be in this predicament in the first place, right? You're that not is Navy, absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, you're not a Navy SEAL, so willpower is not something you want to use. You want to be able to circumvent the situation here. You don't want to be, you know, having to hit it head on and combat it. You want to outsmart it, right? So you want to avoid it, and having a clean environment is critical. And then also, it's very important to keep your goals in mind. If somebody has you know, a blockage in their heart and there's a chance that they could die, they need to keep that in mind when somebody um, is eating a chocolate brownie or they have a taste for a chocolate brownie. They need to keep in mind why they're eating this way. You have to keep it in your brain. The reason you're eating this way is because. Like for me, I became vegan, you know, close to 40 years ago for ethical reasons. And so for me, I would never ever be tempted eating a dead animal. That's just something that, in, that, that, that that's repulsive. So for me, that's not tempting at all, any animal product. For other people, let's say, for instance, it's a sugar thing. Well, once you learn about the dangers of sugar and what's happening to your body, the average person's eating about 150 pounds of sugar per person per year. That's average. Many are eating more. And one of the reasons we have such bad cognitive and neurological decline is because of all that sugar. So maybe if they keep that in mind and say, hey, I want to have a healthy functioning brain as I get older, I want to be able to spend time with my kids or my grandkids and be cognitively there, that may be something. So it depends what motivates you, um, but you need to keep these things foremost in, in your mind why you're doing this program or why you're eating this way. But I, I will say again and again and again, it's never going to be easy unless you have a clean environment because it's always going to be in your face. I, that I totally, I completely agree with you because like, I know that I totally agree. And, and one of the best things you taught me was to keep my refrigerator stocked with healthy um, foods and colorful foods and, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables. And if I did want to go snack, the only thing I could snack on was on these healthy options. And some of the supplements you recommended, like the uh, vital mineral green and the clove and all that, that also helped. But you're absolutely right. I, I agree with you. And I think the environment is really important. And like you said, it's not just your home environment, but it's also your car, your office. It's yeah. everywhere you go, because I would sometimes drive in a different direction because of going home because I would see McDonald's, I would see Jack in the Box, I would see this, I would see that. And that's just like, you know, pounding on my head. Um, yeah. Too much TV. There's so many advertisements about food that it just keeps hitting you, hitting you, hitting you. So like you said, we really have to work that muscle and we really have to keep that environment as clean as possible. I agree with you. Well, and you know, too, you know, in your culture, in the Persian culture, they often put food out all the time, right? They put candy yes. bowls and nut bowls out. So anytime somebody comes over and there's nuts and candy just sitting, sit, sitting around, it's just one of these things that you just habitually just go for, right? And just put it in your mouth and you're eating. And if you live there in that home and you always have that, you're always gonna be munching on stuff like that throughout the day. And calorically that stuff adds up at the end of the day and it adds up in the week and in the month and in the year. So yeah, you gotta keep the environment clean uh, I'm sorry to say that it's not easy uh, because we live in an environment that if you go to a hardware store, there's candy for sale right at the right when you check out, you're being tempted 24 seven. So actually, for some of my clients that are such food addicts, I don't even let them read magazines because the magazines have food ads and I don't let them watch TV with commercials because they're food ads. And it's enough to trigger in their brain that dopamine release right there of anticipating getting that pleasure from that food. I, I totally agree with you. And I, like you, I do believe in food addiction. And it's really unfortunate that there's people in our movement that don't believe in that. But that's going to be a whole one hour topic that you and I will get into about food addiction, versus I think that's something really, really important to talk about. So hopefully we've answered. Yeah. And as I said, I work a lot with therapists. And so I'm used to dealing with therapists that deal with uh, not only food addiction, but drug and alcohol. So why can't the substance that stimulates your brain from, from drugs or alcohol be the same thing from processed foods? It can, it, it is. Sometimes like sugar, it's even more powerful. It's the same thing that's brushing your brain that's, that's getting you know basically the slot machines going and making you go berserk. So I, I've never understood why people don't believe in food addiction. Ask most of your viewers and most of the people I've worked with that have severe problems with weight. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's like almost impossible not to believe in food addiction. 
No, I, I totally am on the same page as you. Okay, so somebody asked uh, JP, what's the best way to get rid of visceral, visceral fat? Okay, well, so visceral fat inside the you know organ, same thing. It's just a healthy, a healthy living, healthy lifestyle uh, exercise. You know, exercise isn't going to be the be all end all, but all those things contribute to some caloric loss. Um, but yeah, whether it's visceral fat or, you know, adipose fat, you know, that's coming on your belly or whatever on your thighs, same thing. It's just a whole food plant-based diet, living a clean lifestyle, making sure you get adequate sleep and, and moving your body. Well, the one thing you did teach me, cause I was such a, um, exercise junkie, as you might, might've told me once that you said you cannot out exercise a bad diet. And that that one sentence has always stuck in my mind. I, I cannot yeah. get that out of my head. I think that was such a powerful um, statement that you made to me because even at my highest weight, I was still exercising like crazy, but I just, I wouldn't, I would I hadn't changed my eating habits. So what you said to me really resonated that you cannot out exercise a bad diet. Well, and what's interesting, I don't want to get too much into exercise, but a lot of times when I work with addicts, drug and alcohol addicts, we, we especially drug addicts, we switch the, the high they're getting from the drugs to the high they get from exercise. And we make that nice transition. But you have to realize that you don't want them only relying on exercise to get their high, because once they get injured, there's no more high and they go back to their addiction. So you have to have many ways in life that you get the highs without just food or even exercise. So I'm not an exercise fanatic at all, never have been and have never promoted it in excess. No, and I agree. So one of the questions that our viewers have, is it normal to lose a pound uh, to a, up to two pounds a week or a month? Well, oh yeah, easily a month. I would say, you know, a, you know some people can routinely lose uh, a pound of body fat uh, in a week, especially at first, but remember you're relying on the scale, which is not accurate. Cause you're going to see, Oh, I lost three pounds. You didn't lose three pounds of body fat. You lost lots of water and hopefully not lean muscle tissue or bone. So if you want to use the scale, you can, I don't recommend it because it's not accurate. It doesn't tell us what we've lost, but yes, you can, you can lose a pound, but everyone's different. You know, and a lot of people who start losing body fat at first can slowly, um, you know, slow down. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry. You know, the problem is, is that most people, all they talk about is weight loss. And I, I ask them, they're always talking about the number on the scale. Well, what's your, what's your blood pressure? You know, what is your pulse rate? You know what I mean? It's like, those are other important numbers too. How long can you balance on one leg? You know, these are biomarkers of aging. When people come to me just for weight loss, I tell them I'm not your person. Cause if you want to lose weight, the first question I'm going to ask you is how much can you suffer? And that's how we can make you lose weight quickly, but I guarantee you won't like it. Well, I remember you had nicknamed me as, what, what'd you call me, a scale monkey? Yeah, well, you, you, you were a junkie. You were constantly on that scale and there was no, was. only fish should have scales. Human beings don't need to have scales. There's, it's, it's inaccurate. We don't know what it's measuring. It's just a gravitational pull. And we don't know what it's actually, when you step on that scale and you say, hey, I gained two pounds, two pounds of what? Did you gain two pounds of muscles? That'd be wonderful. Did you retain some water? Uh, that'd be great sometimes too. No, I, and I agree with you. And the best thing you ever did for me was to throw my scale behind the couch. And I found it six months later. And when I was moving from LA, the, the movers were like, what the heck is this scale doing back here? And I'm like, oh yeah, JP threw my scale behind the couch. So that was, that was really good. So um, how important is food prep? I personally think, it's really important. I think well, you, need to, yeah. you need to prep, you need to have it ready to go so that you can, you know, I think food prep is extremely important. Yeah, as you remember, my suggestion is there's no special day, but I recommend it on Sundays. You go ahead and get in the kitchen and spend an hour to an hour and a half, maybe listening to a podcast, watching a video, or just have it quiet and prep your food for the week. So once Monday comes, and you open your refrigerator, everything is already made in those glass containers. You have cut up vegetables, you have salsa, you have hummus, you've got rice and potatoes, you maybe have some soup, you have all these things prepped. So it's very important to, to have food prepared because again, that's your environment. So when you open up your refrigerator and you see all this beautiful fresh fruit and vegetables, you're inclined to have it. Where if you just had the refrigerator filled with junk, you're also inclined to have that. So food prep is absolutely critical and as you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been to India, you know, and I'm very much into yoga as I always have been, 
but I'm not really so much into the asanas or the postures of yoga as much as the philosophy of yoga. And one of the things that, you know, we need to understand is that you have to have a mindset to be successful. You have to have this mindset. It's not just about physical things. You have to mentally be prepared to handle situations that come your way. And by being prepared, you know, in your kitchen, that is one of the most important things. And, you know, there's the eight limbs of yoga, which to me is really important. And one of the things that I like to share with people is, is the ability to be satisfied with what you have and not overindulge. And so when you have your food in the refrigerator and it's made, you need to be grateful that you have food, grateful that it's right here, it's fresh. And then when you eat it, you eat to 80% comfortable and then be satisfied, be happy. Say, this is fantastic that I was fed and nourished and just be grateful and have respect for that food because a good population of the world doesn't have it. So I think in terms of being successful, you have to also always be working mentally and having that attitude of gratitude. You know, I, I don't think there's ever a time that I turn on the faucet and I see water come out that I'm not literally just in awe. I mean, every single time, I'm just amazed that we have fresh water coming out and we can just turn the faucet on and off, on and off, on and off. Where a good portion of the population is drinking water that has flies in it and dirt and debris. And we're so lucky. So I think one of the things I try to share with clients is that whole mental attitude of just being happy with what you have. And so once you see that food in your refrigerator, be grateful you have it, be satisfied, and then move on with your life. I, I totally agree with you, JP. Uh, somebody asked, what's the best healthy fat for the brain? Flax, chia, walnuts, avocado? Yeah, those are all good. I'd say the flax and the chia and the walnut are critical you know, those omega-3s, we need those long chain fatty acids that get created in the, in the body. So when you're eating chia and flax, um, walnuts, you know, body is going to create those and turn those into EPA and DHA, those important omega-3s. The challenge is, is that not everybody is a really good converter of converting these, these substances uh, into omega-3 and, and omega, uh, even in sometimes omega-6, but usually it's the omega-3s. Um, so if you reduce the omega sixes and they're not bad guys, but they're found a lot in animal products and oils, and then you up a little bit of the healthy ones like green leafy vegetables and some flax or chia or walnuts, that's going to be your best bet for your brain health. And remember a good portion of your brain is composed of that healthy DHA. It's critical for brain development, retinal development. It's important for the sheathing on your nerves. So you want to have healthy fats in your diet. I've never, ever, ever told people to avoid fats. I haven't told them to avoid oils, but I definitely never told them to avoid fats. What do you tell people that are scared of, of eating any kind of fat, whether it's a healthy fat or not, but they're just scared of eating it because they might gain a pound or two. Um, like for me, I can't have walnuts. I'm allergic to walnuts. So I stick to having chia. Well, I'm not sure I might be allergic to chia, but I stick to flax seeds and avocado. But what do you tell those people that are like, I call them fat phobes because they're so scared of having mm -hmm. just that little bit of avocado or that little bit of, of one yeah. or two walnuts or anything like that. You know, we have a lot of people who have orthorexia where they have these eating disorders and they have, you know, fears of certain foods. Generally with those folks, I'm more working with them cognitively, or I'm referring them to one of the therapists that I work with, um, you know, they're, they're, they've got a lot of issues going on. That's not accurate what they're saying. If you look at some of the best researchers in our movement, whether it's Brenda Davis, probably the top dietitian in the world, or Dr. Joel Furman, or even Dr. Greger, not only are they recommending those products, but in some cases they're recommending taking DHA um, as a supplement. Uh, so they're very critical. If somebody's not going to be eating those, uh, foods, then I will 100% recommend that they get a DHA supplement. Um, but usually it's just orthorexia. It's an eating disorder. You know, it's no different than any other eating disorder. It's, you know, emotionally based. Uh, there's no, no logic behind it. Well, here's a, here's a question that baffles everybody. Why do people have such a hard time losing weight and keeping it off? Oh, well, <laughs> Now that's because I don't even I, talk about it for about an hour. Yeah, but. Talk that forever. But, but the idea is because it, your body wants to basically do everything it can to have pleasure. And so the foods that bring you the most pleasure are not broccoli slaw and carrots. 
they're processed foods. So once you get a taste of them and you dance with the devil, it's very hard to get out of that grip. And so it's like any other addiction. It's like saying, how come when somebody's a heroin addict, they keep going back for more heroin? I mean, they're, they're an addict now. It's a very addictive substance. You're not addicted to most foods. You're addicted to processed foods, which really we should not really call foods. They're, they're really drugs. So yeah, food addiction is, is I mean, that's, uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, in 37 or so years of working with clients, it's, it's a way bigger problem than drug and alcohol addiction because everybody eats and it's acceptable to be addicted to processed foods. And everywhere you go, there's processed food. So how could you avoid it? I mean, it's almost impossible. It'd be different for a drug addict if every corner they went, there was heroin and cocaine being offered. Imagine that. This is the same thing. It's just food, but people don't accept it as a real addiction, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's sad because I know for myself, if I go out with friends or to their house or something, they're like, oh, come on, you can have a little bit of this and you can have a yeah. little bit of that. And that's the problem. People people get, like I myself, I, I get cocky and I'm like, well, yeah, I can have a little bit of this and a little bit, it's not going to hurt me. And it's true that I can I can stop it. But for some people that have really bad food addiction, that one bite or, or that one little thing could be the end of it all. I mean, they could go down that rabbit hole and they could start dancing with that devil and never get out of it again. So well, yeah, you, yeah, you wouldn't say to an alcoholic, you know, come on over today. We're having drinks, but I understand you're an alcoholic. You only have to have a sip. Just have one sip and then you'll be OK. I mean, that's kind of silly. That just opens the floodgates and, and then everything is 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 gone haywire. So uh, this is a serious problem, this food addiction. So I, I don't, I'm confused on why people, um, you know, I, when I used to explain to people that they're food addicts, people take offense to it, that they don't like the idea they're food addicts. So, you know, I do my best to just be honest with people, but I mean, I don't know what else to tell them. I mean, what do you, what do you say? You have a, a predisposition to, you know, eating a little bit too much of processed foods. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I don't know how else to word it to people. My job is just to be honest with people and then give them some ways to, to deal with some of their issues. But most people don't like when I'm talking to them and I tell them about what the truth is here, because they, as Dr. McDougall would say, they love to hear good news about their bad habits. That and that's so not true. our job. Our job is really to help people give them accurate information that's scientifically proven and, or in my case, not only scientifically proven, but what I've seen working with clients for 37 years. I mean, that's a long time to see clients. And I think after 37 years, you know, I at least have a little idea what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And I think for me, abstinence was the, the key, like to just literally stay away from it all. And I think that's what truly helps me with it. But people, people don't want to be abstinent. People want to have that little bit of here and a little bit of there. And then they wonder why it goes sideways. So, well, I mean, I don't that's know. Fine. That's fine. to have a little bit here and there. If you can handle it, like I could eat, I don't know, whatever somebody eats a potato chip and have one potato chip and then I'm done. But most people can't. And you can remember yourself when you were at your peak and you're doing, you know, I mean, it was just amazing what you were doing and how fit you were. And then slowly throughout time, I said, hey, you need to start being careful. I'm seeing some things going on here. You're making lots of these uh, date balls and coconuts and all these fun things. And then I had to drop the hammer. And, and what did you end up saying about that? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you remember that you stopped making them, don't you? I did. That, and I, what I was the reason you stopped making them? Well, I stopped making it because you were absolutely right. I, you know, cause I was for my, for my website and my YouTube channel, I was trying to make healthy, healthy, delicious date balls. And they had a lot of dates in them. They had nuts in them, but you were right. I had to stop making it. Cause if not, my weight was going to start shooting up and you're like, ah, 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 you better put that stuff away. No more, yep. no more making balls. And, and those things are very healthy and they're great. For they're addictive. Yeah. They're, they're good for transitions. Yeah. For people from a standard American diet, no more Snickers bars. Now we give them date balls with coconut and all that. That's great. But for people who have food addictions, you know, we have to be very cautious with that. So even those people had food addictions, we got them addicted to a healthier food. And then eventually we start alkalizing their palate. And then we try to wean them off those foods too. No, I agree. And in fact, sometimes my friends come over or my aunt comes over and, she, and then they go through the freezer and they're like, hey, where are those balls? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't make any. <laughs> it's maybe yeah. once a year that I make it and, 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 I, and that's it. Because you're absolutely right. Because it will, it will start trouble. Because yeah. I have a weakness for dried fruits. I, yeah. I truly have a weakness for dried fruits. 
And every time I go to Trader Joe's, I have to avoid that section of the dried fruits and the nuts yeah. and all that because it'll wreak havoc on me and I, and I just have to stay away. Well, just remember, you know, when you have a dried fruit, you're concentrating the sugar because you're removing the water. So it's not natural for your brain to taste that's something that sweet. I'm not saying it's bad for everybody, but it is so calorically dense that it sends your brain into, you know, la la land. And once your brain gets stimulated like that, your brain just says, I want more of this. Uh, yeah, you're right. So for me, it's better that I just stay away. I just, and if by accident, I happen to walk by, I look at them and I'm like, yeah, I got to go by. <laughs> I gotta yeah. keep walking. Well, no, those, those were really good. Okay, so our next question is, is it possible to build muscle and lose weight at the same time? One requires calorie deficit and the other requires calories to build muscle. Right, yeah, you definitely can still build muscle and lose weight at the same time, as long as you're getting enough calories. A calorie deficit doesn't necessarily mean that you're deprived of all calories. It just means you have a deficit. You have less than you really need to take in. So you can still do both. Um, but you, one thing you can do uh, when you, when, when somebody uses build muscle in that term, I'm assuming they mean get stronger. Um, but the way they're wording it is hypertrophy, meaning the muscles being built up. The muscle doesn't have to be built up and increased necessarily in visible size to get stronger. There's lots of people that are kind of thin and they don't look very muscular, but they're extremely strong. Neurologically, they're firing and they have technique and things like that. So yes, you can still, you, you can still lose some, some body fat and build muscle. Wonderful. Um, do you recommend TVP textured vegetable protein as a good source of protein? Well, um, not necessarily as a good source of protein. protein. Archer Daniel Midlands really came out with that. And I think it was like the late 60s or 70s. And basically they're taking soy and you have to be careful because it has to be organic soy. You don't want regular soy because it's genetically modified and loaded with pesticides. So if it was a, a non-GMO uh, TVP, that's a start but they're basically extracting the oil and turning it into kind of like a, um, a flaky material. And they can, they can then make all sorts of veggie burgers and things. And sometimes they might be using chemicals and it can create some MSG, um, out of sodium glutamate, which people can be sensitive to. So, I mean, all in all, I wouldn't say I would run to it to get it. I'd much rather have you have tempeh or edanami or miso um, or even tofu for that matter than TVP and TVP can also be created from things other than soy. Uh, but um, it does make some interesting burgers and, and meals. So I wouldn't be something that I would say is necessarily I would run for, but if you have it once in a while, I don't think it's that big of a deal. There used to be a lot of burgers that the uh, Archer Daniel Midlands, I think they were, they had created some veggie burgers, I think at one point um, that were some of the first ones that came out that used that TVP. I had never even heard about TVP until this question came up and I asked you about it. I didn't oh, yeah. know well, what TVP was. Yeah, it's, you know, it, the thing is people need to understand soy is fine, but you can't have, um, you know, non, it has to be non-genetically modified soy. A good portion of the soy that's created obviously, obviously is genetically modified and there's lots of dangers of that. Um, and a good majority of the soy is not even fed to humans. It's, you know, it's going to cattle, uh, unfortunately. So cattle are eating maybe 12 to 15 pounds of soy or other grains to create one pound of their flesh, which is very unfortunate. Okay. Someone asked, why do I go out of my way to eat junk food if I already have prepared healthy food in my fridge? Any advice to overcome this problem? Well, again, I mean, I mean, your body I wants pleasure. Your body wants pleasure. So the, the, the healthy food that you made isn't nearly as pleasurable as the junky food that you, you could have too. So again, you're, you're always going to be drawn until you're emotionally balanced. You're not going to naturally, you're, you're going to just be drawn to these foods. Once you become more balanced and you have more self-love and care, then you won't be drawn to harming yourself. But you first have to know that those foods are harming yourself because there's a lot of people that don't know any better. They're drinking milk and eating hamburgers and they think they're good for them. Once they understand that they're, it's not good for them, then you know that's kind of our start is education. But my suggestion in that case is I try not to take food away from people. They're, they're bad food. All I ask them to do is fill up with healthy food first eat all the healthy stuff. And then when you're done, if you choose to have some, some 
bad foods, well, then you'll eat less of them. Um, so I don't, when I work with clients, I don't make judgments on what they do. And I also don't try to take foods away. So when I can remember working with really hardcore, like construction workers that they're always, they're going to be eating hamburgers. So there's no way around that, at least the first weeks and months working with them. So all I would propose is that, can you just make sure when you eat your hamburger that you put a couple pieces of lettuce and tomato on it? And that was a big stretch for them. And they agreed. And then as time went on, we just keep increasing that. And then I would say, listen, do you think that maybe you could eat a salad first and then eat your burger with the vegetables on there? And then they'd get to that level. And then eventually I'd propose, could you have a veggie burger? And back in the day, you know, the veggie burgers weren't as, it, I haven't tried the new ones, but I heard there's all these great new burgers. But in the day, I used to eat some of the the more processed ones. And that was still hard for them to do, but it, it satisfied them. If they put enough ketchup and mustard and vegetable. So one day a week, I got them to eat a, a veggie burger and the rest of the week, they're eating a salad first, then their burger. So I wasn't taking away their poison. Uh, I was just adding more good into their life until eventually most of those people ended up just transitioning toward a plant-based diet. Yeah, I agree with you. I remember something else you taught me. You said, until you fix this, you can't fix that. Yeah, there, you really can't. I mean, it's it has to it has to it starts up here because most people are emotional eaters and they're addicts. So once you get your brain balanced, then everything else becomes easier. Yep, you're absolutely right. Oh, here's my favorite one of my favorite topics. Can you talk about hitting a plateau and how to overcome it? I myself hit a plateau for six months when I was doing this, and I totally yeah. could. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, is like, let's just say, for instance, you and I hit a plateau. OK, but then you and I moved to Gilligan's Island. So Gilligan's Island means lots of labor you and I are doing and not much food. Do you think our plateau would go away? Yes. Yeah. So you have to just kind of change your program. And so for a lot of people, you know, there's there's reasons people can hit plateaus and people have, you know, Sometimes their body just normalizes to where it thinks it wants to be, but it doesn't mean we still can't get healthier. What this person is referring to, I'm sure, is a weight loss plateau. And again, I don't focus on weight loss. I try to get people as healthy and fit as they can. And then your body normalizes, it, its blood pressure goes where it wants to, cholesterol levels go where they, they're supposed to, weight eventually goes where it's supposed to. But here's the thing that most people don't talk about, and a lot of people might disagree with me who's to stay? that in our society, we have to look like a supermodel. You know, I've worked with supermodels and I've worked with some of the most famous people in the world. And I've got news for you. The way they attain that status, one isn't always natural. In other words, they, they have some work. But number two, the amount of suffering and medication they use is at a level you couldn't even comprehend. So I don't think our bodies are designed to look like we see in Hollywood. I see our, I think our bodies are designed to look more like primitive people. When we look at primitive cultures, the women have still body fat on them and so do the men. So it's not unnatural to have body fat on you. To be stick thin and have a certain Barbie look is not really how we're designed. That's more designed by a surgeon and a dr uh, you know, drugs and, and uh, caloric restriction to an extreme. Yeah, no, I agree. Um... What was really funny for me too, when I, when I hit my plateau, I continued to do the same thing that I was doing before. I didn't stray off course, but what I noticed was my size was getting smaller. The scale wasn't all moving all that much, but the, but the size was coming down. And I remember you and I had hours and hours of conversations about it. And you said the same thing, focus on your blood pressure, focus on the size, focus on how you're feeling, how you're looking. And you were absolutely right. And eventually that just, I overcame that, so. I mean, if everyone around you is a supermodel, then you are gonna be thinking you're supposed to look like that and you're gonna beat your self-esteem up. What you don't realize is like when I used to go to photo shoots, the models would come walking back toward me. And as they're walking toward me, they literally looked like biology skeletons. They had no body fat on them and they were as thin as can be. And I'll never forget one model came came and sat down and started chain smoking. And she said, the photographer wants her to lose another 10 pounds. I mean, it's oh, like, wow. are you out of your mind? I mean, it's like, where would you possibly find that weight to lose? I mean, there, there's, there, it's, it's, it's a crazy industry and I've written about it before. And I've actually had the, um, 
the fashion industry called me and wanted to interview me. And I said, I think you guys would never want to hear what I have to say about the fashion industry, because I think it's one of the most repulsive industries out what they've done to people's brains and women, especially women, their self esteems and make them look, uh, try to make them look in a way that's so unnatural. It's just, you know, that's the problem when you're a baby, you're as a girl, you know, we're given as a boy, a GI Joe and a slingshot, and you're given a Barbie doll and an easy bake oven. Your roles are starting to be established when you're a child and women are trained in a horrible way to believe they need to look a certain way that's unrealistic and definitely not healthy. And should be of a certain size. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Look yeah. a certain way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody always looks at their size on their pants or, or whatever is their shirt. And they're, they're like, that's a, a status symbol. It's crazy. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, so I know you you love health force and the products that they, that they have. And somebody wanted to know what are the, uh, what are, what are the benefits of a supplement called greener grasses by health force? Oh, I would yeah, like I have... to know more about the benefits. I have mine actually here. So I use um, the vitamin mineral green. I love that stuff and I don't travel without it. Yeah. And then I use greener grasses. I keep these handy because I add these to my water. And so they're both, um, they're both similar. They're just different greens blended up. So imagine if you would just take some kale and some chard and spinach, dehydrate it, and then put it in the blender. They created a powder. That's basically what they've done. So why do I recommend it? Well, one, most people aren't that I'm working with are not eating enough vegetables and they're not going to eat enough vegetables. So it's easy for me to take some vitamin mineral green or greener grasses and to sneak it into their smoothie, sneak it into a soup, sneak it into something. This way they're getting a lot of greens. Now, one of the things that I've been saying forever and people used to disagree, but now they're, they're saying, oh, wow, JP, I can't believe you were saying this so long ago, is I always told people you need to eat a variety of foods. And there's a lot of people in our industry and in our movement that said, no, you can just eat the same foods over and over again. And that's the reason why that's not true is one, each plant has its own diversity of phytochemicals and nutrients and particularly fiber. As you're learning from a lot of these um, gut doctors, the more variety that we get in our diet, the better it is for our microbiome. Yeah, no kidding, because the microbiome is feeding on a variety of different plants. And so a lot of people don't eat enough variety of plants. So I just use a powder for them. Now, do you have to use it? No, you don't have to use it. You just eat a variety of plants. But for me, when I travel, it's critical. Now, what's interesting is just recently, you know, we had some bad floods here and our truck was, our, our, our sanctuary truck was, was hit on the street during ice storm, whatever, five months ago. And we lost that. And now we just had floods and the car got soaked. So I really wasn't able to get to the store because we didn't want to drive it. So I didn't have all the vegetables that I needed. So I, I used a lot more of my powders in smoothies and things like that to just get my extra greens in. And so I use it for that. The other thing I recommend is use um, a powdered green just mixed with water and then sip on it throughout the day. Let it coat your tongue and it starts alkalizing your palate. And then you're less uh, prone or inclined to have uh, sweet foods. It alkalizes your palate. I know. I, I, well, I always travel without it, with it. I'm sorry. I don't leave home without it. And I always have it before going to a party or to a gathering. And I'll sometimes drink it at the party, at the gathering, yeah. just because it helps with temptations and cravings and it totally helps. So yeah. I agree. Now you yeah, and you can use any green. I, Health Force is the best company because they're all glass, they're all organic. You know, everything is the highest level, and um, I just love their all their products. But if you let's say, for instance, you didn't have a lot of money, you could just take, like you had a garden, you can just grow your kale and your chard and your spinach, um, and then just basically dehydrate it and then put it in the blender, and then you can make your own. So you you can do that too. You don't have to buy it, um, but if you want the best quality, I would get the Health Force. No, I, I agree with you. Um, here's a great, I think this is a great question. Uh, why do some people gain weight by eating too much starch? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, what's interesting is, you know, I've been saying forever that not everyone can eat unlimited starch. And I've worked with some people that are in our movement that are leaders and I've worked with them and I'm not exaggerating. They're stick thin and I'm not kidding you. They can eat 600 grams of carbohydrates, 600 grams. Well, that's that. I have other people that I've worked with that once they start overeating a little bit on rice and potatoes, 
it's not working for them. So everyone's different. And remember this, a lot of people coming in, and I don't like using this term, weight loss to lose weight, they're already coming in with an endocrine problem, right? They already have their organs aren't working as well as they could. So they're not going to be processing foods as well as Joe down the block, who's an athlete and is exercising constantly and this and that. So one of the things I asked Brenda Davis once, and I've asked her actually, I think it was three, maybe two or three different times throughout many years is Brenda, do you think you can eat all the carbohydrates you want without gaining weight? And she said, absolutely not. So Brenda is considered the top dietitian really in our movement. And most all the vegan doctors love her research and everything she has said. So I have not seen everyone with the ability to be able to eat unlimited carbohydrates. Some people can, uh, but I haven't seen everyone be able to do that. And well, let me I, ask you this, Shada, how does it work for you to eat unlimited carbohydrates? It, it, it doesn't work for me. And that's what I was going to say. I cannot eat all the potatoes and all the rice that I want. Right. Um, I eat a lot of vegetables and I eat, I actually feel better eating a lot of vegetables and eating beans and quinoa. Um, but then if I do have a potato, I can only have like one or two smallest. I'm not, I'm not one of those that can eat unlimited amounts of potatoes or rice. I just can't. Right. I've never been that person. So to me, this yeah. was a great question because there is a lot of people, like you said, that can eat all the potatoes and rice that they want yeah. and not gain weight. And in fact, they're going to lose weight. And there's some of us that are the total opposite. Yeah. And one of the challenges I see is that um, when people do that, I think it's a challenge if it displaces the amount of vegetables they eat. In other words, if they fill up on vegetables first, then eat potatoes and rice all they want, that's different. But a lot of times they're going for the potatoes and rice first. And then the amount of vegetables they take in is minuscule. Because that, that I agree. That yeah. I agree. That I, I go, I still go for the vegetables. I and I will eat that first, the salads, whatever, and then I'll have to have a potato. But if I do the opposite and have the potato, I don't even want to have a salad. So yeah, and I, I, I agree. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any questions about uh, specifically about weight loss coming up, but I do want to say this. This may cover it if there is. When I work with athletes, some of them need 10,000 calories or more a day. I actually don't have them eat vegetables first. And the reason is, is if I do, they're going to be so full, they're going to lose weight. And my athletes don't need to lose weight. So imagine you, in your, not your case, but our listeners who are trying to lose weight, which I'm not, I don't really like talking about weight loss because I think it's kind of silly. But if you were trying to lose weight, let's do the opposite then. And let's eat lots of vegetables first. And they get the starches later, whereas the athletes, they eat the starches first and then vegetables later. Now, you may be thinking, well, don't they need more antioxidants uh, because they're athletes and they need more vegetables? Absolutely. Good thinking. And in that case, I always, that's why we do smoothies. And in that case, that's why I do uh, powders for them, because it's an easy way for me to add it in without them having to chew salads after salad after salad, spending hours chewing. They just won't do it. But you still recommend lots of fruits and vegetables. To who? To, to people that are trying to eat this way. To, to get oh, oh, yeah. Well, I recommend fruits and vegetables to everyone unless, you know, large amounts, unless they're just new to this, then I start real slow with them, slow and steady. If they have some GI issues, we start slow and steady. Um, yeah, of course. Well, fruits and vegetables are, are, are going to be our healthiest foods. No, no doubt about it. What I was just trying to say is that for athletes, if I had them eat a big salad first and some broccoli and cauliflower, by it's time when it's time to get the calories and they wouldn't i've worked with some athletes like sean munson even who, who who did earthlings and unity the producer and writer of that he came to me 165 pounds six foot around two and i built him up to you know 210 pounds um he would um the term actual actual term is anorexic you lose your appetite many times when you exercise so when he was done exercising he lost his appetite so the last thing I'm going to do is have his first meal be vegetable. So I had to have him do shakes with lots of fats and, and higher levels of protein. And then of course, green. So I'm always recommending fruits and vegetables, of course. Of course. Um, can you talk a little bit about nutrition uh, for the nervous system? Yeah. You know, my background's in geriatrics and that's what I really devoted so much of my time to. I created really the first brain building programs, probably 30, maybe 30 years ago or so. Um, in Chicago, using a plant-based diet and different nutraceuticals, nutrients for the brain, then building brain building classes for the brain, and then exercise classes for the brain. 
And one of the things that really scares me a lot is when I would see kids coming in my office with their food diaries, which was all sugar, and the more sugar they're eating, at least refined sugar, are destroying their B vitamins and magnesium especially. And those are important nutrients for the brain. So you need to have higher levels of B vitamins for your cognitive functioning and your metabolism. And the more sugar you use, the more diuretics you use, the more you're losing you know, potassium and magnesium and things like this, the more you're affecting your brain. And so for people who have neurological problems, you really want to make sure you're getting those beans, peas, and lentils in, the broccoli, you know, nuts and seeds, things that are high in B vitamins, and even the omega-3 and B12 that, that basically forms a nut myelin sheath. Now, one of the things that I see a lot, and this is going off topic, but I have to say it, you see about 10,000 deaths a year from seniors taking falls. Now, that doesn't count the millions of seniors who are taking falls and getting permanent disability and injuries. One thing I, can, I have to say is you need to be doing exercises that are fall prevention activities, because if you're not and you take a fall and you already have osteoporosis, forget it. Your femur can snap in half and puncture the femoral artery and you can bleed to death. When your head, which is like a watermelon, hits the cement and that cracks open, that life can be over. So I have some clients that I work with that come to me and they ask about, they have you know balance issues or they have neuropathy and they can't feel with their feet or their fingers, my gosh, you need to be in, in with physical therapy or doing sessions constantly working on your balance and coordination and maximizing your, your diet. Okay. Um, you know, Dr. McDougall sometimes recommends for people that want to lose weight to do a 50-50 plate. So what are your thoughts about a 50-50 plate? I, I don't know what a 50-50 plate so is. 50-50 plate is basically 50% of your of your plate is going to be starch and then 50% of your uh, other, the other half is going to be vegetables. Oh, yeah. Well, again, it's, that's, that's basically what I've been saying is not everyone can, even though Dr. McDougall is, you know, one of the greatest pioneers in the world, he's basically saying right there, yeah, not everyone can eat unlimited starch, right? Yeah, no, that so, I agree. Of course. So then they're just adding more vegetables to their plate and getting enough carbohydrates to be satisfied and have enough energy to move. Uh, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I've been saying. Perfect. And then what are some of your um, tips on getting enough calcium because this person asked, even though eating calcium rich foods, I don't come anywhere near the minimum requirement. Well, I mean, green leafy vegetables are going to be chock full of calcium. You know, the Bantu women in Africa would breastfeed many, maybe sometimes eight, eight kids in a lifetime. And they're eating, you know, plant-based foods and getting four or 500 milligrams, maybe a calcium. Uh, they're just not getting the calcium thieves, the high protein diet, the phosphoric acid, the lack of exercise, tobacco, caffeine, things like that. So we don't need high amounts of calcium, uh, but we do need a nice symphony of calcium and magnesium, vitamin D, boron, and protein. You know, one of the things that we see in the vegan community is sometimes that we're so lean that we don't have the same bone mass as, as other people. So we do have to be concerned about osteoporosis, but believe it or not, calcium is not your biggest worry. It's those other things like micronutrients like boron or even other nutrients that are like zinc and for sure protein because protein is critical for building bones. But maybe more important or equally important as that is making sure you're stimulating your bones constantly with resistance training, weight training, uh, power walking, jogging, jumping rope, something that stimulates the bone. Um, on my Zoom series, if you go to johnpierre.com, you'll see the pillars of health. You click on that. That's a 17-hour Zoom series I did. And I talk quite a bit in depth to different doctors and practitioners uh, about bones, especially Brenda Davis, who had her bone density tested. And she's in her 60s, and she had the bone density of like a young girl. So um, yeah, calcium is important, but just keep eating lots of green leafy vegetables. Figs are, are a good source also. Blackstrap molasses, um, nuts and seeds are a good source also. But remember, it's not just calcium we need. That, that is so true. Let me ask Aaron, I'm gonna, if you guys are um, asking questions online, I'm going to ask Aaron right now to see if there's any questions that we, what was it, Aaron? Uh, what, do you, what do you think of nutritional yeast? What do you think of nutritional yeast? I mean, if nutritional yeast, like any other seasoning, is going to make you eat more vegetables, I think it's definitely worth it. I think where you run into a problem with nutritional yeast is when people start consuming, you know, pounds and pounds of it. It can affect, um, there's some research showing that it can affect kind of, you know, your cognitive abilities in large amounts. So I don't have an issue really with nutritional yeast at all um, in small amounts. 
especially if it's make, it's like when people say, Hey, JP, I'm only going to eat my vegetables. If I put this salad dressing on, I don't care what salad dressing they use. As long as we start out with them eating more vegetables, that's a great start. What do you think about intermittent fasting? Well, I mean, intermittent fasting, I've always said is, is important um, because, you know, it, it, we're, as human beings, first of all, we're not designed to be eating three meals a day plus snacks all the time. If you look at the nature, sometimes animals eat only once or twice a week. So it's healthy for your system. The only thing really proven uh, to extend longevity is caloric restriction and intermittent fasting can, it doesn't always mean it will, but it can help reduce your calorie load throughout the day. Now there's some people that do one meal a day. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's always a good system, especially if you have uh, severe digestive issues. Um, but I think, you know, for me, ideally, I'm not saying I do this all the time, but ideally it'd be great if I could start eating at 12 and be done at six. Uh, that's ideal. Other people like to do start at, you know, 10 o'clock or whenever, but I generally try not to always necessarily eat a breakfast just because I'm naturally not always hungry. So the longer that I can go, like ideally is again, 12 to six, but that doesn't always happen with my schedule. Yeah, that's basically my schedule, um, 12 to six. I've never been a morning person to eat. Yeah. Uh, I typically will eat like around 12 or one, and then I try to be done by six. I don't want to wow. go in any that, later. Yeah, than that's that. good. Yeah, I don't want to go. And then, and then you got me into the habit of a fruit and vegetable day, which I, I didn't want to do. And I, and I was kicking and screaming and I, and I really didn't want to do it, but man, oh man, now that I'm doing it, man, I can do that all week long and it's been the best thing. And you remember what I used to say, you can believe me now, or you can believe me later, but either way, you're going to believe eventually. And I do believe I am a firm <laughs> believer, a firm, firm believer. Well, we'll do someday, maybe a show on the fruit and vegetable day. We could do a, a thing about that. Oh, absolutely. Because I think that's going to be, and then we could show them exactly what a fruit and vegetable day looks like. Yeah. It's a great tool. Um, do we have any other questions? How do you, so somebody wanted to know about um, only eating fruit for breakfast. Well, it depends on what your goal is. Um, you know, it depends. Like it's, I don't think it's always ideal if somebody's trying to, um, you know, trying to really, I, and again, I don't like talking about weight loss, but I know people are here for it. If people are trying to lose weight, I think it's more ideal to have vegetables in the morning. Um, the hardest thing to eat for most people is vegetables. So you want to try to get it in throughout the day. So I think every meal should have vegetables. Um, it, it's, you know, so there's a lot of people that I know and I've worked with that do fruit um, just in the morning. You know, Harvey and Marilyn Diamond, they really help pioneer that kind of coming from natural hygiene. Um, a lot of that theory of fruit in the morning. And, you know, if you want to, um, some people's blood sugar, uh, that it doesn't work real well doing that. So I guess it just depends what your goals are, and what you want. Um, right now it's peach season here and cherry season and nectarine mm -hmm. season. So I probably eat a, more fruit, um, than I normally would in winter. So I guess it all just depends on, on what your goal is and what you want to do. But I do have some clients that do just fruit in the morning. I actually love having fruit in the morning, especially after I've been working out, like I go boxing and, and, yeah. but I've noticed, this is for me personally, what I've noticed, if I start my day with something sweet, I want more sweet throughout the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's safer for me to start with something like a vegetable or savory, because then I'm not wanting all that sweet. So well I, you're I right. have to learn to adjust that. And that's one of the things you and I talked about forever. When you wake up in the morning, you're the most acidic. There's a lot of metabolic processes that took place at night. That's often why people's co uh, tongue is coated. So the most important thing is the alkalize in the morning. And that's why a lot of people, I just have them use a green powder and sip on it as their first thing of the day. But, you know, I, I don't want to discourage anyone ever from getting fruits and vegetables any way they can. So I think the question is a great question, but I think I need more details. Like what is your goal? That's the main thing. What is your personal goal? That's true. Well, believe it, uh, unless we have any more questions, Aaron, do we have any more? Um, there's questions, but I'm not picking up. I'm trying to just pick out health or well, We're trying to stick to weight loss and nutrition yeah. for this. So segment. we can oh, okay. pick these questions yeah. for another oh, video, One thing I do want to cover quickly is, um, you know, I think, again, I think it's important that we're prepared and we make our food. I'm just making it up on Sunday and have it all available. When you travel, make sure you bring your food. I recently just came back from teaching at a conference. And then even though all the food there is vegan and healthy and it's perfect, I still bring food with me. 
when I went to India, even though I was staying at, at, at an ashram where it was all going to be vegan, I still brought food with me and my bag got lost that had 50% of my food in it, right? The airlines lost it, but luckily I still have food with me. So it's important when you travel um, to bring food with you, to plan ahead. I carry um, freeze dried stuff like um, this company. I use their stuff, Go Leafside. It's really delicious. It's dehydrated vegan food and it's based on Dr. Greger's recommendations. So like recently when we had the floods here, I just couldn't get out because I didn't want to drive the car that was soaked in water and I didn't have the time to bike because I was too busy cleaning up all the water. So luckily I had a lot of the gold leaf side stuff and that was super easy for me to make. All I did is add hot water. When I travel, I still travel with that. I still take hummus. Um, you can just make hummus and put it in a dehydrator and then dehydrate it and then just put it in a glass container. When you travel, you get to your hotel, you just add water to it. It can be hot water or cold. And then I have hummus with me. So I always travel with stuff. And I know people are still traveling for summer. So just make sure that you're always bringing the food that you need with you because then you're controlling you know, your environment. And that's critical because if you don't control your environment, your environment will control you. So I bring my green powders with me when I travel because I know I'm not going to always get all the vegetables I need. And then I bring my, um, you know, I'll bring my freeze dried stuff with me. And a lot of times I might not even eat it, right? I just have it and then I bring it back home. Uh, but at least I know that I have it. When I went to India, I brought a, uh, one of those uh, kettles that you plug in and it heats the hot water up so I can make my food. Even though they had all the vegan food I needed, I still wanted to have extra food with me. No, I totally agree. And when I travel, I, I take food with me. I always have something just in case. And um, yeah. and it's great to have that freeze. I've never I've never tried the freeze dried that you showed. Yeah, the gold leaf side, you know, doctor, it's based on Dr. Greger's re recommendations. So they put all the, you know, his, his food, foods that he likes in there. And they make a really cool thing is they make a smoothie that looks just same thing like this. It's a smoothie and you just add two cups of water or so, and then some ice. What I do is um, if you, you don't have to use ice, you could add frozen blueberries in there. And then they make some oat, oatmeal bowls too, that I really like. And I love the company because everybody's there is vegan and they're just good people. They're just good people. And I love supporting companies like that, but you have to travel you have to have these foods not only for emergencies in your home, but when you travel, I mean, a perfect example was this flood that just, you know, destroyed our car. And I just couldn't get, I just didn't have the time to bike to the store because I was too busy cleaning up. And luckily I had these foods and it was just easy, add water to it and I could eat it and get back to cleaning. You know, when the pandemic hit, it was really interesting. We'd go shopping and I, you know, I like, let's say we were at Costco. So here I was buying all, all the fresh produce, and I was yeah. buying beans and, and rice. And then I see everybody else's cart and they're just picking up whatever junk food they can. And I'm just yeah. going, and nobody, it, nobody was at the fresh fruit and fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And, yeah. you know, we were picking all that up. We were picking frozen fruits. We were picking up the frozen vegetables and just the beans. The pandemic, yeah. didn't, like it, it was great. Like it didn't bother us one bit. Yeah. And, you know, um, on jumpier.com, I have a, um, another Zoom series that was made right when the pandemic hit. And one of the segments that I did was on emergency preparedness. And that's been one of my uh, most requested videos. People really love that because I talk about emergency preparedness and, and things you should have. So these, you know, the, these pandemics and these disasters, you know, just like this huge flood that we had here and, our, and you know, different parts of the uh, U.S. that got hit with the flash floods. These things are part of way of living now. So you kind of have to have some of these foods because when you get stressed, you're going to you're going to be more um, inclined to eat junk because you're stressed. So if you have some of these healthy foods in your home ready to go, if you can't get to a store, it makes life so much easier. That, that I agree with you. I think we're done with questions, right, Erin? Or do you have you any have more? Is it, if it's, as long as it's related to nutrition and food, we're okay. If it's I exercise have... or anything else, we're going to save that. We're going to save all those questions and go through them when we do the, the segment on the pillars of exercise. So this yeah. one's related to diet. So how does diet impact ADHD? You know oh, well, that, that I mean, I, you know, in, in the pillars of health, one of the sections is on enhancing cognitive functioning, which is really what my, my background is with seniors. Um, and I, I tell a story in there of a client that I had, I, I don't, it was a young man. And I don't remember how many, I think it was like nine psychiatrists and six psychologists. Then they gave him every med known, then they gave him experimental meds and nothing worked. Then they brought him to me 
And not only did we change just his diet, we changed his lifestyle. And then his mom said, um, people were running up to her saying, what new medication is he on? It's a miracle. It wasn't a, a medication. It was, we changed his lifestyle and attention deficit and hyperactivity. These are something that is rampant today. You can't even imagine how many people, not just kids are on Adderall and, and different medications for the inability to focus and, and stay calm. Your diet plays a key role in that, especially those B vitamins for sure. But so okay. read the section, you know, buy, buy the pillars of health, but I always recommend reading the last two chapters first because those are on compassion and love. And once you get those last two chapters, then the rest of the book is gonna make all the sense in the world. And, I, and we have put the link to uh, the Pillars of Health on the, in the show notes. So make sure you go and yeah. get them. And then all the stuff is, if you go to johnpeer.com, I have JP's um, favorites. We don't sell any of those products, but like the Beat Boost, you know, things like that that I use or um, the Health Force. Health Force doesn't even have a, um, they don't even have like an affiliate link. I just put them on there because they're the best company. But some of them are affiliate links, which means if you buy them, you click on them, the company knows that you ordered them through our website and then our sanctuary just gets credit. And our sanctuary site is livingwithharmony.org. And you can just see some of the work that we do there, rescuing animals and uh, child trafficking and things like that we work to, to eradicate. So feel so free to can, check it out. That, that leads me to, a, to another question. So how can people donate to your organization? Yeah, thank you. I just sent out a newsletter because when we got hit with this flood, the only car and vehicle that we have to use for animal rescue and taking styrofoam and plastic and all the stuff we collect is with that vehicle. So uh, just livingwithharmony.org and there's a donate button. We're trying to get um, a car or preferably a truck or an SUV so we can continue our work. Um, that's always great, you know, greatly appreciated. Most of the money that I make just goes right back into the work that I do. You know, when you live kind of meagerly and you don't have a lot of needs with food, just eat, you know, some of the basic stuff. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to spend much money on all that stuff. So um, follow us on Instagram too, because we have a lot of great posts on Instagram of the Living With Harmony site. Yes, definitely. And I think Aaron said we have one more question. We have one more question, but while we're talking about you, JP, or your website, um, where can people access the videos that you did? They were, I know it's not nutrition related, but it's your exercise videos. Oh, well. You know, uh, artist or her son. I have a couple things. One, if you go to johnpierre.com, go on the very bottom of the page and just fill out your name and, and uh, email and all that. And then that's to be on my mailing list. And Im immediately you'll be sent to, I think it's a 20 minute like exercise video of me talking about movement and the importance and how to do it. And then on the same site, we have uh, three exercise videos that Dr. Lori Marbus had me produce. One was strength training with exercise bands. One was balance coordination and, and fall prevention. And then I did one on jumping rope too. And with the jumping rope, I just took a jump rope, cut it in half so everybody can jump now. And I go through these different footwork patterns that are critical, not only for coordination, but that movement is really critical for bone density. I have one of those jump ropes. You, you got me one and I just jump and I'm just yeah. going up. Yeah, it's the I same thing as jumping it. rope. You just, you yeah. don't get your feet tangled. <laughs> yeah, that's what, true. what was the website again? Uh, just johnpierre.com. And that's in the show notes. I put uh, oh. your link in the show notes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I don't like Dr. Marbus, you know, is an amazing vegan physician. She's the one who asked me to make those for her. They were up on her site and now they're on our site. That is something that we do make, uh, or at least, yeah, well, we make money. It goes back to the sanctuary. But other than that, we really don't sell anything. Everything else is just affiliate links of products that I like. So, but everything basically goes to, most all of it goes to my, my 501c3, my charity. Any okay. other questions? This is the last question we'll do. Um, so this is from Sin, which I'm guessing is short for Cynthia. JP, there are I are weight standards out there. A five four woman woman's ideal weight is four is between one oh six to one fifteen. But how does that fit in with the concept that our bodies find their own comfortable weight? Yeah, well, all those, yeah, all those charts are nonsense. Those are crazy charts. I mean, especially when you've seen some of those people that are considered obese and they're just extremely muscular. So those charts are crazy. I would never, that's the problem is that the, the food addiction and in these mental um, imbalances, those people are always worrying about numbers and weighing and measuring their food and getting on the scale and looking at their clothing size. 
Look at, as I've said from day one, the reason I don't focus on weight loss is because it'd be like me just focusing on blood pressure or pulse or you know how well you can balance on one leg. As you get healthier, all those things improve. So we need to stop just focusing on weight loss. And we also, most importantly, need to totally get rid of this fashion industry and, and supposed to look a certain way. Do you, I mean, I could talk for a long time about how dangerous high heels are and the foot problems that women and men too, but particularly women get from the fashion industry. I, there's a whole segment on my Zoom program where we bring in Stephen Sashen who created Zero Shoes. And then we bring in Dr. Emily Spleckel, who's a, uh, a podiatrist that talks about the benefits of barefoot training and zero shoes. So, I mean, this fashion industry has really hurt us. And the problem is, is every child that's born today is getting indoctrinated into this, not only through social media and movies and TVs, but all the toys that they get, all the toys that they get, all these, all these, these Barbie dolls are so unrealistic, their builds and, and girls start thinking that's how they have to look. I've written many articles on this before. It's, it's, a, it's an atrocity. Uh, what's happening to our society. Yes, and that's very true. I, I know that was supposed to be our last question, but I have one really <laughs> good question for you. Okay. And that is, and it's not just my question, a lot of people have been asking me, when are we going to do another John Pierre Pillars of Health retreat? Like the one oh. we did in Chicago, that was so wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, yeah, thank you. That was really an exciting event. That was done at a, um, a nun and priest um, school where they go to school and there was, you know, obviously there was a massive lake and the, and the accommodation was great and the food was amazing. I'm working on another one in Chicago for next year. I'm looking for volunteers to help me get that going. I'm looking to do one in California and one in Colorado. Um, but with my schedule, especially with all the volunteer stuff that I do, I need help and I, I need volunteers that are willing to do that. So if you, if you are willing, send me an email and my email is foods, F-O-O-D-S-F-O-R-L-I-F-E-J-P at Yahoo. And maybe you could put that in the show notes uh, too. Just um, my it email. is in the show notes. So your email, oh, and your website, everything's in the show notes. But yes, people, if you really want this to happen, um, yeah. well, obviously, you know that me and Aaron would be of, of help. And uh, especially in California, I think that's a great yeah, idea. You should do it in California. <laughs> uh, I think you should do yeah. one in California. But well, I love going to Chicago and where you have it. And what I have to say is, what I really loved about your retreat was the fact that it was a small, intimate group. Yeah. You didn't get lost in like 100, 200, 400 people. No. You, you I were kept it a, small. Yeah, you kept it small. We all got to know one another. I'm still friends with the people that I met there. Some it was, the, the chat, yeah, right? some people are on the chat right now. And, oh. uh, and no, it was great. We could cry. We could laugh. Yeah. We could all, you know, just, it was just a beautiful, um, beautiful four or five days that we spent together. And it was yep. just, I can't thank you enough. It was absolutely wonderful. And, you know, we kept it as absolutely cheap as we can. And I didn't make one penny from the retreat. Any money that was left over went to my sanctuary, to my charity. So we, you know, it's, we do it as a service. And remember, the key thing about that um, retreat was it really wasn't focused on just nutrition. We covered a lot of different topics. I talked about how to develop morning and afternoon and evening rituals. We talked about breathing. We talked about laser focus. We talked about trauma. We talked about emergency preparedness. Uh, we did exercising or movement all throughout the day. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. So definitely get on my mailing list, um, johnpierre.com, go on the bottom of the page and just fill that, that out. I'll send you, well, the computer sends you a free video and then um, we can let you know when there's new things going on. But please support livingwithharmony.org. Even if you're just looking at it, um, you know, that's great. Tell people about it. We always obviously can run, we, we run only on donations and then me supporting it. So every dollar counts because, you know, we have a lot of animals that we take care of and we basically only take in special needs. So the bird could be missing a wing, uh, the dog or the cat might be paralyzed. And so most people wouldn't take in those animals and require a lot of attention and care. And that's one of the reasons why we're fundraising to try to get another vehicle because uh, we have to constantly pick animals up or transport them. And if there's an emergency, we need to be able to evacuate them. And, and I think one of the easiest ways that people can support you living with Harmony um, is going through Amazon because that's an easy thing to do. We all yeah. shop on Amazon and yeah. uh, like you're my favorite charity. So whatever I spend, 
on Amazon, a portion that goes to living with harmony.org, which I think is the easiest way of doing it. Yeah, and it's just called Amazon Smiles, and we're we're living with harmony in Boulder, Colorado. So you'll know it's us. And then you just put us as your charity, and whenever you order, we get a tiny percentage of that, and that all goes to the animals. I mean, we don't get it, just the, the charity does. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful way. Well, I think we went a little bit over JP, so I think, uh, I hope you don't mind, but it's, this has been an absolutely wonderful session. And I'm so glad that you and I have decided to do these series um, as much as we can. For those of you that don't know, Aaron and I are going to be out of town. We're going on the NHA holiday holistic uh, cruise to Alaska, so we won't be here. <laughs> Erin's dancing right now. You can't see her. She's behind the camera. Um, so we will be leaving and we'll probably resume back in the, I would say, what, the first week of September? Yeah. First week of September. But until then, uh, we'll probably have release a video for you guys during the week. Um, but JP, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I hope the flood is, uh, is you know, what you guys are doing is going to be quick and easy and you're not working too hard and the animals are staying safe. And I want to thank everyone for being here tonight uh, to watch another um, video from Healthy Cooking with Shada. Uh, Jean-Pierre, thank you again. I can't thank you enough and we'll be talking soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Good to see everybody. And thank you, Shada and Aaron. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you.